as we finish this year, we're going to devote these last five Sundays of the year to preaching about the miracles of Jesus. As we begin, I want to say a few words to you about miracles themselves. The word miracle comes from a word which means something like a marvelous event. And by marvelous, what we mean is something that you would truly marvel at. It's something that can't be understood in normal physical terms. It's inexplicable. It goes beyond natural forces. And it is marvelous in another, another, another way because it serves as a sign which causes you to wonder and think about something. The miracle is often used in conjunction with other words in the New Testament. Sometimes the word miracle is put alongside of words like signs and wonders. It causes people to focus on God. It usually is a sign that points people to a bigger truth than the event itself. You understand this. A miracle is not just something that is healing this person or bringing this event for its own sake, but it has typically something that is a message which is deeper than that, something bigger than that, something that points, for example, to who Jesus is, or how we can trust him, or what the character of God is in some way. We see this in a number of places in the Bible itself. For example, in John chapter 20, it says this. This is the very end of the Gospel of John. It says, Jesus did many other mirac miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. Understand this. It said he did lots of miracles. Some of them are written down. Some of them are not. But these are written, these ones that are written down, are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Did you all understand that? The reason that Jesus did these miracles, listen, and the reason that these are written down for us is so that you, on reading this, may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior, and that by putting such faith in him, you may have eternal life. So the miracle isn't just a standalone thing, it is a signal, a sign, pointing us to faith in Jesus. Another similar text, Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Right now, Peter, in this moment, is speaking to a crowd of people, saying, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Here he says, the miracles, they were wondrous things, they were signs. God did this to accredit Jesus to you. He is showing, he is proving to you that Jesus is the one you are supposed to have your faith in. That's why these miracles are taking place. For our sermon series, we're going to divide the miracles of Jesus into five kinds. Today we're going to be hearing about the miracles of nature, that is, things where nature is changed in some way because of Jesus' miracle. Next, miracles of healing. After that, miracles of deliverance from demons. Miracles of divine knowledge. And finally, miracles of raising the dead. Today we look at nine miracles that show Jesus' command over the forces of nature, starting with turning water into wine. We're here at John chapter 2. And verse 1, it says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Cana is a place that's some 20 miles away from Jesus' hometown. It's a place where Jesus' mother apparently has now walked to to get to a wedding. Perhaps there was a relative of hers who was being married. That would explain why she might be there. And Jesus himself was invited along with his disciples. Something we can take note of as we get into this story is that Jesus himself loves marriage. The first miracle that he did was at a wedding service. And it is right to this day for you to be inviting Jesus to be at your wedding and to be a part of your marriage. This is right to have Jesus at the center of all of that. Jesus and his disciples are invited to this wedding at Cana. During the course of the wedding, reception during the course of the festivities, something happened which was not a good thing, especially in their culture. It says in verse 3, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. There would have been the food that would have been spread out and all of the food of the vine that would have been there and everybody would have been served as much as they needed and this would have gone on for a long time. And even today, if you were hosting a wedding and you began to run out of the food that was needed, that would be embarrassment. In Jewish culture, it would have been shameful 
it would have been an awful thing to say, we are here to be hosting you, and we have failed to provide what was needed. It would have been a shame for the whole family. That's, again, perhaps why Mary, his mother, said to him, we need to do something about this, because it would have reflected on the whole family. And she came to him and said, they have no more wine. Jesus said to her, why do you involve me? My time is not yet come. What he may mean by this is his time for doing public displays and miracles and so forth was not yet. And rather than being deterred by that, Mary simply said to the servants who were there who were attending things, the ones who were serving the food, she said, do whatever he tells you to do. And this is really the key. Let's listen to this. There are things that Jesus will tell you to do. Even to this day, he says, this is what you need to do. And to this very day, your job is to obey what he tells you to do. If you see it in his word, your job is not to think about, well, is that what seems right to me? But instead to say, that's what Jesus says, that's what I will do. If the Holy Spirit through prayer says, this is the thing to do, you want to obey whatever Jesus says to do. And Mary has it clear in her mind, and she turns to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you to do. It tells us in verse 6 that nearby, right there at the reception, stood six stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. A 30 gallon can would be the size of a typical trash can that you'd have that you take out in the street. That's a big thing. If you filled that with water, that would be heavy. The can itself, the jars they have, were made out of something heavy also. I don't think that they went and carried that out to the well, but instead it would have made trip after trip after trip somewhere in the well and brought water in and poured it into this big jar that was there. And they did it for all of these different jars. It would have taken some real work to do that. Why are they doing this? They're doing it only because Jesus told them to do it. No one could understand at this moment how this was going to help anything. Jesus told them, I want you to fill this up. So they did. They came and they poured and they poured and they poured and they poured to fill up those six containers, filled them to the brim. Verse 7, it says they filled them completely to the brim. Then verse 8, he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Take it to the caterer, take it to the one who is in charge as the host, and take a little bit of it to him. It tells us when they did so, the master of the banquet, verse 9, tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. And he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. Something I can tell you, this was not something where someone dropped a little food coloring in the water. This was something where he recognized this is better than anything that's been served as yet. This was not a fully public miracle. The manager didn't know that there had been a miracle. He thought somebody shipped in the best, the last. The bride, the groom, the guests apparently didn't know that there was a miracle. A handful of servants knew, Mary knew, and most importantly, the disciples who were with Jesus. And therein is the first sign, a miracle that was meant for their benefit, not for the rest of the public, but for them. It tells us this, verse 11, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. Remember when I said that miracles were meant to be a sign, they signify something, they teach something, they show something. Jesus did the first of those signs to show himself to his disciples, and it says, his disciples put their faith in him. It produced wonder and trust in their hearts. They thought, Jesus can do that. He can change water into wine. He can change the very nature of something. And interestingly, he did it without any big fanfare, without any self-promotion. He just did it, and hardly anybody knew. Here was somebody that they could trust. And so we have the first of his miracles, turning water into wine. And that brings us to the second of them. We have a word about the catch of fish. We'll try not to have the squealing there, Daniel. That'd be good. Good. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 4.
Luke 5, beginning at verse 4. Let's all turn there. Soon after this incident with the water turned into wine, Jesus began a healing ministry, and crowds began to form, people who wanted to be healed by him. One day, Jesus withdrew himself from those crowds and got off with his disciples, particularly with Peter, and the result was a miracle of great meaning. It tells us here, starting at verse 4, we need to finish speaking, that is, speaking to the crowds. He said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Jesus is sitting in Simon Peter's boat, and he says, Simon, I want you to take the boat with you and me and maybe a couple of the other guys, and let's go out into the Sea of Galilee, into the lake, and I want you to let down your fishing net for a catch. Simon answered in verse 5, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Now let's understand this. The best time, apparently, for fishing in that body of water was at night. <clears throat> that was common. They'd have big, bulky nets that were easy to see during the daytime by the fish, but they'd put down these nets at night, and the fish would swim into them. And the nets were made out of something that was good enough that they would tend to tear easily. You'd have to repair them in the morning. You'd repair them, you'd mend them, you'd fix them. You'd dry them, get all the glep off of them, and get them prepared for the next night. Peter says, we worked hard all last night. We tried really hard all last night, and we didn't catch anything. The fish aren't in this part of the lake. They've gone elsewhere. And not only that, but I've taken the nets, and I've done all the repairing, all the cleaning and washing. We've hung them all up, and we've done all the work ready for tomorrow night. And I'm ready to go to bed. It doesn't look like it'll be fruitful. I don't see the point in this. Understand that Peter is a professional fisherman, and he says, this isn't a good idea. But he follows that up with, but because you say so, I will do it. Remember what we said in the last miracle? The one key thing we're supposed to do is to obey. And so once again, we've got the same idea. Peter says, since you tell me to, I will obey and I will do it. Let's see what happens next. When they done so, verse 6, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. The nets were filled so full that normally what you do is you take the fish out of the net and you get them into the boat so you can take it on back. And it took two boats full to get all of them in, and both of them were close to being swamped because of how heavy the fish were. This was not something that would ever happen. You don't get that many in one net full. And they did. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. He falls to his knees and he recognizes the contrast between himself with a sinful human heart and Jesus Christ who obviously is not that kind of a person that he is. He is divine. He is God. He says, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. But this miracle was a sign. It did cause astonishment to Peter and his fishing partner, something bigger than he could have imagined, because it involved fishing. This is interesting. If Jesus had stood before him and said, this is all of what I can do. I can create these things. I can do all of this. You need to follow me. I'm not sure Peter would have really heard it. But Jesus does a miracle in the department that Peter is good at, which is fishing. He's doing this miracle in the area of fishing. And so... Peter listens closely, and Jesus uses this for a larger lesson. Jesus said to Simon, verse 10, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. You've been up until now focused on catching fish. From now on, you will be catching people. You will catch souls for me. How can Peter be sure this will be successful? Well, because Jesus has already created overwhelming, enormous success in catching fish. And so if Jesus says, I can do that, it's easy. You can catch fish all day. Now you're going to begin catching people. You're going to do this. You're going to do this for me. As a result of that miracle, seeing that sign, coupling it with Jesus' words, it says at the end of this, so they, not only Peter, but his fishing partners, James and John and others, pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Well, 
come to another miracle, why don't we turn a few pages forward in the Gospel of Luke to, verse, or to chapter 8, starting at verse 22. It's chapter 8, beginning at verse 22. <coughs> One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go to the other side of the lake. I want to point out something about that. When Jesus gives a directive, and when Jesus gives a firm promise through his word or elsewhere, we can trust him. Jesus said, we're going to go to the other side of the lake. In a little bit, the disciples are all going to believe they're going to drown with the bottom of the lake. If Jesus says, let's go to the other side of the lake, he intends for them to go to the other side of the lake. All right? So he says, we're going to go to the other side of the lake. Let's go do that. This, again, is what we know as the Sea of Galilee. And I'm going to tell you something about the Sea of Galilee. It's located in a place where there is a mountain range nearby that makes it kind of a V-shaped and wind comes through that. It makes a little bit of a wind tunnel, so you get wind coming across that. But the lake is also rather shallow. And somebody has explained it this way. If you take a really deep bucket of water and you put some, you know, a lot of water and then you try to blow on the surface, not a lot's going to happen. But if you take water and put it on your supper plate and put it there and then you blow on it, what's going to happen? Oh, it'll, it'll blow off the plate, it'll create all kinds of uproar because it's so shallow. You get this? The Sea of Galilee is rather shallow, it's in a wind tunnel, and so sometimes <coughs> there's not a lot of wind happening, you can be calm. But when it kicks up, it really kicks up. And storms can come on this lake that are really severe. This can happen. What we're going to run into is a storm that is so severe, even the fishermen who work on that professionally for a living were terrified and believed that they were going to drown. Let's see what happens. One day, verse 22, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. Jesus was exhausted. He'd been doing healing and teaching of the people day and night for several days, and he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake, so the boat was being swamped. That means he was so full of water, it was going to go down any moment. And they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. In the Gospel of Mark, it says, using their same words, it says that some of them said, don't you care that we're going to drown? Let's understand this. Jesus does care. Jesus does care what happens to us, and it is correct for us to address and say, this is the need. They did come to him, but they were already fearful. They believed they were going to drown. They thought he didn't care, and they said so. Here we see a contrast and I think it's worth noting the contrast. The disciples feel fearful and upset and believe that it's going to be the end of the world. And Jesus is so perfectly content in the hands of the Father that he is asleep. He's asleep and at rest. And they wake him up and say, we're all going to drown. Jesus does the following. He got up, so there in verse 24. And rebuked the wind and the raging waters, the storms, the storm subsided, and all was calm. And then he rebuked his disciples. First, he's made everything completely calm all at once. And then he turns to them and says, Where is your faith? Why were you afraid? He says in some of the gospels. And why were you afraid? Where is your faith? The storminess in your own hearts is worse than the storm that's going on on the sea and he rebukes them. This is a lesson, I think it's a test, and I need to understand this. Is everyone listening? Several of the miracles are preceded by what I would call a test of faith. God certainly could have made it a really lovely day to cross the water. Is this true? God could have made it so lovely that they would have wanted to just bask in the glow, the glow of how wonderful it was. Instead, God allowed it to be stormy, and frightened to them. And it's meant to test their faith. Does God allow storms and tests of this nature to come to our lives? Yes? Yes. In fact, the Bible says that He intentionally allows such things to come to our lives so that our faith may be strengthened and tested. I pointed this out to you, those of you who have been involved in sports. The coach doesn't make the practice as serene as possible. He instead tests and pushes and pushes so that you can get stronger at what you do, right? The Lord himself 
says, there will be testing that will come into your life, and it's meant to strengthen your faith so it gets stronger and stronger. And this is something God does intentionally. But our job is not to freak out, but instead to say, I will have stronger faith and trust in him now than I did last time. That's our job. This was a text. And it's also a sign to the disciples that they can trust Jesus without fear. This miracle demonstrated that better than words could do. If Jesus had simply said to them, you can trust me, it's all right. But they never went through the test. It would not have helped them as much. They go through the test, and then they're like, wow, look what Jesus did. Notice how this ends. In fear and amazement, still in verse 25, and this would be the fear of God, and awesome awe and amazement. They asked one another, who is this? They thought they understood Jesus. They thought they understood all of who he was. Yeah, he's pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Glad to follow him. And it's like, wow, who is this? Even the wind and the wave obey him. He can stand up and control all of what's happening in natural forces like that. This is remarkable. They say to him. Jesus has command over every kind of storm. Every storm in life. Physical storms and the emotional and spiritual and other storms. Jesus is in We come next to John chapter 6, starting at verse 1, and hear about another miracle, and this is one that's recorded in all of the Gospels. It's the feeding of the 5,000, John chapter 6 and verse 1. Once again, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, withdrawing to a lonely region to teach his disciples. But great crowds followed. Huge crowds followed. And Jesus tests his disciples by asking them a question. Remember I said that oftentimes a miracle follows a test? In this case, the test is one that Jesus initiates by asking a question, starting in verse 5 here. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked us only to what? Say it again, he asked us to test him. That's right. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. God already had in mind what was going to happen about that storm in the last miracle. And it was a test. Now here again, Jesus knows what he intends to do about all this, but he gives a test. He said, where can we find enough bread for all these people? Philip answered him, eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. I could spend two-thirds of my annual salary, and there's so many thousands of people here that they could all get a nibble, but we don't have that much money, and there isn't a store nearby to buy it if you wanted to. There's no way it can't be done, Philip seems to say. Meanwhile, Andrew, another disciple, verse 8, spoke up, and he said, here's a boy with five small barley loaves, and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Andrew has looked around and say, what resources do we have? And what they have is this, they have a boy's lunch. The five fish would be five little dried fish, and the two loaves would be two little rolls, and all of this would have been packed along probably by the kid's mom, and that's what they have available. Jesus said, verse 10, have the people sit down. There's plenty of grass in that place. The men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Let's see if we understand what's going on here. Jesus can do much when our little is completely offered to him. You have something to offer to the Lord. It may not be much, but you have something to offer to him. One of my favorite stories is one about a dear woman who was a Christian in Russia, and she was very nearly paralyzed, except that she was able to move slightly one hand and one finger. And so she decided she would use that hand and that one finger to 
type out manuscripts. She was a bright lady, and she was able to take Christian literature from other languages and translate it in her mind into Russian, and then use a Russian typewriter, the one finger to type, type these out. And she had some um, carbon paper in between, and this would make multiple copies. And in this way, she would translate books and type this out slowly, one letter at a time, with one finger that still worked. And then these would be distributed to other Christians from church to church, back in a time when it was against the law to do anything of this sort. People at the time thought, well, why isn't she raided and arrested? And what, why isn't uh, there problems? And then it was discovered later that the authorities already knew she was paralyzed and could do nothing, so they didn't bother. She could only do things with the one finger. She used that one finger for Jesus, and it turned into bringing many to Christ. If you have that much, you have something to offer to the Lord, and then he can take and expand into something miraculous. If it's fully offered to him. And so, this little boy has the five lobes, the five fish and the two lobes, and this much is offered to Jesus. Jesus thanked God. He began to distribute the lunch. He gave to the diners as much as they wanted. It multiplied and multiplied. It was unending. Jesus can provide all that's needed. This is what abundance is, by the way. Listen. Everything that God calls you to achieve, he gives what is needed. Generally speaking, he doesn't give less than what is needed for what he's called us to do, nor does he give a lot, lot, lot more, except a little bit more so he can share with others. And that's what's happened here as well. All were fed, there were 5,000 men, there were other women and children too. After they had enough, he said, well, let's pick up the leftovers. And the amount of leftovers was more than what they'd started with. Obviously, we have had a miracle. They pick up 12 basketfuls of leftovers so that they had something further to share. What was the response of all of this? There is a lesson in all of this about depending on Jesus and giving ourselves entirely to him and making him Lord of our lives. And the disciples and the crowds both somewhat missed it. The disciples missed it a little bit. I know that they did because some weeks or months later, there was a similar incident where there were great crowds. We're going to come to this in just a minute. And Jesus said, what should we do about feeding them all? And the disciples said, oh, we couldn't possibly. And it's like, okay, we've already been through this once. It happens again. But it's even worse with the crowds. And I will tell you why. Listen to this. The crowd saw all of this, and they got all the food, and they said, that's cool, that's wonderful. We're going to make him king. He's, he's, a, he's, he's like a prophet. We're going to make him king, and we're going to force him to just keep making food for us, always. Did you understand this thing? Instead of saying, Jesus is Lord, and we're going to serve him and give what little we are to him to be used by him, instead they said, we're going to get all of him to do what we want, because we'll be in charge, and you will be the one who will be our miracle worker to feed us always, and we won't have to go work. That's what the crowd said. And Jesus would have none of that, and he slipped away, and they buried him, and all of it was gone. They misunderstood the point of it. They should have put their faith in him, and instead they just wanted to pour stuff for them. Would anyone misunderstand that about God today? And rather than putting their faith in him, they would just say, I want more of his stuff. Does that happen today? Yeah. It's what the crowds did after this miracle. They missed the sign. They missed the understanding of what the miracle was meant to teach. We come to the next of these miracles. Here they are gathering the basketfuls afterwards. The next of these miracles. We can start for a moment here in John 6 where we still are. It says, when evening came, this is immediately after. You see this, John 6, John 6, 16. Right after this incident, then when evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat, set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark. Jesus had not yet joined them. The strong wind was blowing. The waters grew rough. Understand what's going on. Jesus said, I tell you what, you guys go ahead of me. I'll catch up with you in a little bit. I want you to get into the same boat that brought you. I want you to start rowing across the lake and go back to Capernaum, which is their home base on the other side of the lake. I want you to go back there. Now, if you've ever rowed in a rowboat, you know that sometimes the wind is blowing the same way that you were rowing, and you feel really strong. It's, you're just going great. Sometimes the wind is blowing the opposite direction. Have you had this happen? You're canoeing, you're rowboating, 
and the wind is blowing strong the other way, and it's all you can do is just keep rowing, and you're going nowhere, and you're going a lot of nowhere, and this is happening to them. They're rowing and rowing and rowing and rowing and rowing, and all through the night they're rowing, and the wind is going against them, and they're not making any headway. Now, the story is told here. It's also told with some power in Matthew chapter 14. We're going to turn there. Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 22. Start here at verse 22. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, and in verse 23, Matthew 14, 23, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. That's what I told you. Wind blowing against the boat, they're not making progress yet. During the fourth watch of the night, what does that mean? The first watch of the night was when the sun went down at 6 o'clock there, from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. That's the first watch of the night. And then from 9 p.m. to midnight, the second watch. From midnight to 3 a.m., the third watch. And now this says about the fourth watch. Now that's 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. They have been going at it, growing for a long time. And I suspect they're tired. About the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. He is walking along at a faster clip than the boat is going. He overtakes them. And they see something that would probably frighten anyone, you or me, if we were boating on the water and someone is walking across the water making his way toward us. That's what they saw. When his disciples saw him, verse 26, walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. They believed that this was a spiritual thing, and that it may even be an evil spiritual thing. They didn't know, and they were horrified. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Peter is an interesting one. He is more courageous in ways than the rest of them. More, oh, what word am I looking for? He is more spontaneous, impulsive than the rest of them. And in this case, he's more talkative than the rest of them. In this case, he says, Lord, if that's with you, tell me to come on out and walk over to you. He says to them. And so Jesus said, you come. And so Peter got out of the boat and began walking toward Jesus. When Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus, but when he saw the wind, verse 30, and was afraid, he began to sing, he cried out, Lord, save me. Now what's happening? He began walking toward Jesus, and then he looked around and said, there's big waves, and I'm walking on the water, and this can't be happening. Ah! And he began to go down, taking his eyes off of the Lord, putting his eyes on the storm and the circumstances instead. There is a lesson for us in this. As long as you keep focused on Jesus, he can bring you through any storm. And he can give his power for you to accomplish things that you wouldn't ever be able to if you keep your eyes on him. As soon as you take your eyes off of him, put it on yourself and your circumstances, then it all goes down in a hurry. And he began to cry out, Lord, save me. What happens next? Immediately Jesus reached out his hand, verse 31, and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Rather than having doubt about what the Lord has asked, I want to make this very, very clear. It is not and I, you must hear this, church. It is not Jesus' goal for us to think of something really sort of um, outrageous and do it. Lord, I'm going to jump off this building, and if you have your miraculous power, then you'll catch me. That is not what I'm talking about. We are, however, talking about how when there is a need, and God says, I want you to take this step of faith, and it is utterly impossible for me, and we know it is the Lord, and we do that, we keep our eyes on Christ, and he meets that need, as he has here. And he said, why did you doubt? Why were you full of fear and doubt? That's not going to help the situation. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. The disciples in the boat had this reaction. 
They worshipped him. They're getting stronger and stronger in their idea of what his identity is. And they say to him, I understand this. You truly are the Son of God. This sign solidified in their minds Jesus' identity. It drove into their hearts the call for faith rather than a call for fear or a call to doubt. And all of this is hardcore training of the disciples with lessons that we're to learn as we read this because that's why it's important for us. We go to another miracle. We're going through really all these nature miracles and we now come to the feeding of the 4,000. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 15. It's Matthew 15 and verse 29. The Bible tells us in this chapter that Jesus has entered a region that has many Gentiles as well as Jews. Just before this event, Jesus had healed a Gentile girl. The point of this chapter, as much as anything, is, listen, Jesus is for all people. He's not just for the Jewish people. He's also for the Gentile people. He's for everybody. And that's part of the point of all of this. And great crowds form here in chapter 15. And these crowds are Jewish people, some of them, and a lot of Gentile people. It's all kinds of people. And they're with him, it says, for three days. Many were healed, but by now many of them were hungry. And Jesus expresses his compassion for the crowds because they have nothing to eat. He called his disciples to him in verse 32. I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? Do you remember when I said to you earlier that the full understanding that they could have got about how and way, the way that Jesus works in these situations didn't quite sink in, because instead of saying, well, Jesus, you did this before. What would you like us to do now? They said, there's no way. There's all of these crowds, and there's no way we can take care of this. There, there's nothing we can do about this. Jesus asks them, how many loaves do you have? Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. Part of this is, of course, to be able to identify what we do have, so all of it can be given in Jesus' hand. And I think part of it, too, listen, is to help them assess the fact that they don't have what it takes. Once you already know that you don't have what it takes, and you're sure you don't have what it takes, then you are ready to admit that this was God's doing than you. And so they tally up all of what they have, and they say, well, we just got these seven loaves and a couple of small fish. He told the crowd, sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves and the fish, and when he had given thanks in both miracles, the feeding of the 5,000 in this present miracle, Jesus gives glory to God, thanks God, looks to God. He gave thanks. He broke the bread. He gave it to the disciples. They in turn gave it to the people. The bread and the fish, they all ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000, besides the women and the children. After Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and went on to another place. What are we going to say about this miracle? Several things. Everyone eats, everyone is fully satisfied, there's leftovers again. There were so many similarities, but in this case, the crowd was a little different. It was 4,000. It was people who were Gentiles as well as Jews. And something else. Jesus himself, just a little later, refers to this and the previous miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. He said, do you remember when we fed the 5,000? It was like this. And you remember when we fed the 4,000? It was like this. He says, these are back-to-back -back incidents. So we did this thing twice. Why did it happen twice? Well, partly, I guess, because the need arose and then it arose again. More, I think, because the disciples needed the lesson reinforced. Somebody might say, well, the disciples were awfully slow. Why didn't they get with the program? I'm going to ask you, how many of you have had a lesson from the Lord that you've been One. Three. We're up to five. All right. I suspect that for some of us, we've had the Lord teach us something, show us something, and then we botch the thing and get afraid and all upset. And he said, listen, let's do it again. I'm going to walk in the room again. I'm going to walk through this thing again. And trust me next time. And then a year goes by, and we find ourselves in another desperate situation. Have we ever needed to be taught the same lesson a third time? Do you get where I'm going with this? Let's not be too hard on these disciples. They needed the lesson, they needed it again. God does work that way. His disciples needed the lesson reinforced. And I think it also gave Gentile people a chance to witness this sign, 
that they had not seen when their Jewish counterparts did in the past. What did the signs signify at least this? In the hands of Jesus, our very little becomes all that's needed to accomplish all that God has called us to do, with even a measure left over, to further bless others. And our job is to trust Him rather than to be believing it's impossible or reduced to fear. It is a miracle, as you've seen, of full provision, complete provision for everything that's needed. And we have another miracle of provision, and this is a miracle about a coin and a fish. Go with me to Matthew 17, if you would. Matthew chapter 17, starting at verse 24. Here's another miracle of provision covering everything that's needed. Jesus sends his disciples to return to their home base in Capernaum. And some tax collectors approach Peter. After Jesus and his disciples, verse 24, came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax, the drachma is a coin, it's, each drachma is worth about a day's wages. So this would be a tax that would be an annual tax worth about two days' wages. And this was not the tax that went to the Roman government, it wasn't a tax that went to other kind of governmental things. It was a tax for one thing specifically. It was a tax for the upkeep of the temple in Jerusalem. And so every Jewish man was supposed to pay annually this tax to keep the temple up and going. You need to remember that that's what this was for, because that would be important. This tax collector said to Peter, doesn't your teacher, this Jesus, pay the temple tax? Oh, yes, he does. Peter came into the house, and Jesus was the first to speak. Now, this is interesting. Peter's out in the street, somebody comes up and says, Hey, don't you and your teacher pay the taxes for the temple? And there's kind of an accusation that says, We're not sure you do. And Peter says, Yeah, we really do. It. But he doesn't pay them right that moment. I don't think he had the money on him. Another disciple kept the treasury. And so he goes back into the house, and Jesus already knows what the conversation was about. This is one of many, many, many times, all throughout, where Jesus has divine knowledge about what's going on. In fact, one of our messages is going to be about miracles of divine knowledge, because Jesus, in addition to all the other things that he's doing, knows what's happening when he isn't there. And so he speaks first, and he says, Simon, let me ask you a question. When the kings of this world, when they tax people, do they tax their own family, or do they tax their subjects, the other people outside the family that live on those taxes? And Simon said, well, they tax the others. They don't tax their own family. And Jesus said, well, that's right, Peter. And he intimates, it's like this, that he himself is the very Son of God, the Son of the one worshipped at this temple. He should be exempt. Peter and the other disciples are now in God's family, and they would be effectively exempt, especially given the fact that Jesus himself through his death and resurrection, which is coming quickly, is going to make this temple obsolete. There's going to be no more need for there to be all these sacrifices and supporting it year after year. On and on. No more. But Jesus also says, so that we will not offend them. And this is a key principle. If I'm trying to share Jesus with others, I am not going to intentionally bring some offense over something that doesn't matter. If I go to a certain place and I know that a certain custom is offensive to them, I'm not going to do that if it doesn't matter. If everyone there needs to eat with their left hand, I'll eat with my left hand. If everyone there needs to wear a hat, I'll wear a hat. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus says, if everyone here collects the two drachma tax, we're not going to make that a big issue right now. We know that the temple isn't going to go on this way. We know that belonging to God as we do, it isn't even something that is needful, but I'm going to do it anyway. And here's how we're going to handle this. We're going to let God provide for this. He told Peter, I want you to go out down to the lake, and instead of putting out a whole big fishing net, just take a rod and reel and throw out the line. And the first fish you catch, there's going to be a coin in its mouth. Some of the fish are bottom feeders there that will um, go whoop, 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 and they'll, they'll, they'll take rocks and other things and put it in their belly or whatever. And so you can readily picture if there's coins on the bottom that people dropped off their boat accidentally, I assume, that a fish could get one of these in its mouth. It's not a big deal. But the thing that you're going to just assume the first fish you're going to catch is going to have that right kind of a coin in its mouth, that is something only the Lord could know. It's not something that anyone could just make happen. 
And he says, you're going to catch that fish, and it's going to be right there in its mouth. And so Peter went out, and it, that is, in fact, what he did. He caught the fish, and there was the coin so that he could go and pay his tax and Jesus' tax. But there is a lesson behind all of that. Yes, we can trust God to provide everything we need, and also that the life of Jesus Christ is one which is going to supersede the Old Testament temple. And something new is going to happen in Israel. That scene there, and it's seen, I think, even more clearly, even more forcefully, in the next of our miracles, this is the next to last, the fig tree, seen in Matthew chapter 21. We'll turn there. Matthew 21, starting in verse 18. Early in the morning, and now we're in, just so you understand, we're in the last week of Jesus' life. We've gone all the way through Jesus' Career, his ministry starting with the first of his miracles. Now we're getting near the end. This is the last week before he dies. And Jesus is walking to Jerusalem, into the city, or nearby the city, walking toward it. Early in the morning, he was on his way back to the city, it says, verse 18. He was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except figs. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. Talk to you about this for a moment. Jesus sees a tree that is leafy. It looks like it ought to have figs on it. It looks like it should be thriving. He gets there and finds there's nothing on it except the leaves. There's no fruit. And he says, you will never bear fruit again. One lesson I need you to know right away is this. That the fig tree was a kind of symbol of Israel, the way that in America we use something like the bald eagle as a symbol of our country. And as a result, we can go to the extent of protecting that bird and say that you can't, um, oh, you can't kill it, you can't, you know, look at the memory, you can't even take its feathers and um, put them up in a little display in your house. They say, don't do that. This is a symbol of our country, treat it right. The fig tree was a symbol of Israel. And Israel had some outward Kind of signs of leafiness, why it uh, read the Bible, had the temple, claimed to honor God, but there was no fruit there in terms of real faith in Jesus Christ to save you. understand this? And so Jesus gives a living lesson in this miracle. He says, in the same way that Israel was soon going to be no more, it will not only have that temple worship ended, but in fact, in just a generation, all of Israel was completely destroyed by the Romans. The Jews were scattered here and there and everywhere. And their faith in that system of sacrifices and so forth would be all complete. And so Jesus said, may this tree produce fruit no more. And it is a living symbol, a living lesson. All of these miracles are a sign of something. Are you getting this? And so it's a sign. It's a teaching. It's something that's being put forth here. And he said, you will not be any longer having any of this kind of um, fruit in your life, and the fig tree withered. The disciples saw this, verse 21, and they were amazed. They said, how did the fig tree wither so quickly? And now Jesus gives them yet another lesson. If the fact that it was cursed and withered taught them one thing about spiritual matters and so on, they also said, well, how did it happen so fast? I mean, if I went and chopped out the roots and poisoned the tree, I think I could probably get it over the course of months to die off. But over the course of hours, I don't think that it would all look dead and wither and shrivel up that fast. How did it wither so fast? They're amazed by this. And he gives them a further lesson in faith. We can just look at Jesus' own words and see what he has to say. When the disciples saw this, verse 20, they asked, how did the fig tree wither so quickly? And Jesus replies, verse 21, I tell you the truth, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. What is the point here? To have a fig tree with her is kind of a big deal, but it's not a super big deal. It's not going to change the whole world. Moving mountains from here to there is a bigger thing. And in fact, he says, you will, by your faith, be able to accomplish greater earth-shaking than anything about a certain plant. And those who know Christ and trust Him and live for Him can have their lives changed far more than that, miraculously have God worked through them in greater ways than this. 
If you believe, verse 22, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. We need to think about a little bit of the application here. Jesus says, those who see miracles are those who believe. If you believe, you're more likely to be asking for miracles in the first place. You're more likely to be expecting God to work in great ways. And you're more likely to see powerful things happen. And what's more, if you're walking in the spirit of Christ, the things you'll be asking for will be commensurate with what it is that he wants in the first place. And it'll all come together if you have real faith. Let's put that kind of faith in action and you'll see powerful things take place. The one who says, oh, God doesn't do much and never does anything for me, is unlikely to ever see much happen. But we have yet one more miracle. And this is another catch of fish. We're going back to the Gospel of John. This is where we'll end it today. John chapter 21. Now this event occurs just a week later, a couple weeks later perhaps. Jesus has died. He has risen again. Listen, he died, he rose again. He began to appear at sporadic times to his disciples, saying, Wait for me here, I'll show you myself here. And so when he told them to go and meet him in Galilee, he would appear to them there. This is shortly before he ascends into heaven. And while there, the uh, disciples decide that they're going to go fishing. Verse 3. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told the other disciples. And they agreed. They said they'd go with him. All that night they fished and caught nothing. Have you heard this story before, it seems? Fished all night, caught nothing. The Bible tells us that in the morning, within the three hours of the daylight in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, verse 4, and the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. I can readily understand why. As the sun is just beginning to come up, and you look from a boat onto the shore, sometimes the person who's there looks like a silhouette rather than anybody you can really see. And that figure on the shore shouted out, Friends! Have you caught any fish? Which would be a normal thing to ask. I, I grew up fishing a lot. And the thing that fishermen do when they see each other is they say, Are you catching anything? What's biting? What are you using for bait? They, they talk about fishing. And so if he says, Have you caught anything? That's perfectly natural. And they said, No! He said, well, throw your nets out on the right side of the boat, you'll catch some. They've been fishing all night. And the idea is they've probably been fishing the net on this side of the boat, and now they're going to put it on the other side of the boat, six feet away, and they're going to catch it. It doesn't seem very likely. But you never know. You know, fishermen are endlessly optimistic, so they put the fish on the net on the other side of the boat. <laughs> when they did, it says, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number. That was what happened last time. You remember that last time they pulled in another boat so they could begin to get with it. There were so many fish they couldn't even begin to offload it into the boat. That many fish. What they're going to have to do in the end is they're going to have to slowly row the boat back, dragging this net full of fish, and then just beach the boat, beach the net, and pull the net onto shore is what they're going to have to do. When the disciple whom Jesus loved, that was John, said to Peter, he said, it's the Lord. And Peter heard him say, it's the Lord wrapped his cloak around him and jumped in. In other words, John said, we've seen this before. This is how Jesus acts. And I want you to know that in your life, there are times when God has done something before, and then he does it again. And then when it happens the third time, you say, I'm getting this. That's God. He, that's, how he, that's how he speaks to me. That's how he acts. And this is God. And that's what John did. He said to Peter, it's the Lord. It's Jesus. And Peter didn't say, oh, that's cool, we'll get there pretty soon. He said, wow, and he throws on his coat and jumps in and swims to shore. And he gets to shore, and they drag in all the fish, and they found that there were large fish, not little puny fish, but big fish. There were 153 of them in the net, which for a net of that kind, you know, you know dry beans or something, they, you know, the, wet, the, the net usually wouldn't be able to hold all of that. But they pulled it in, and they found that it hadn't torn at all. It was something of a miracle in itself that that net needed no repair after this. And there's Jesus on the shore, and he's got a fire going, and he's already cooking some fish and some bread for breakfast. You always sort of wonder, where did Jesus get these fish from? 
I think this may have been a miracle as well. I mean, there's these little miracles within miracles where he's got some breakfast made and Annette didn't tear and they all were there and all this. And Peter is standing there and Peter is the one who just days earlier had denied the name of Jesus and turned away from Christ. And there he is standing face to face in front of Jesus. And after they eat together, Jesus drew him aside. And he's even going to use this miracle as something of a lesson sign. Because do you remember that sign before when he caught so many fish? Jesus said, you're going to be a fisher of men. You're going to give your life to catch others for me. Could that still be true now? After all the mistakes that Peter made. And Jesus draws him aside and uses the same idea, changes the analogy slightly and said, you're going to now take care of my sheep. Those that are being caught, you're going to shepherd them. You're going to be the one who feeds and cares for my sheep. That's going to be your job. And he uses this whole miraculous episode to reinstate Peter, the job that he's supposed to have. Peter, interestingly, takes a look back at the, at the Apostle John, who they see across the way, and he says, yeah, what about him? What's he going to be doing? And Jesus said, don't worry about it. It's none of your business. If I want you to live this life and to die in this way for me, that's fine. If I want John to live forever and do something different, don't worry about it. It's none of your business. And there's another little lesson here, guys. What Jesus is looking for is for you personally to give everything to him and to follow him with your life. And your life is going to look different from somebody else. If you spend your time comparing your life against somebody else, if you spend your time thinking, my life needs to be just like that other person, that other person got miracles. That other person had these wonderful things happen. What about me? God says, don't you worry about all those other people. You need to have a relationship uniquely with me. And I'm going to do something with your glory to me and a little different from the next person. And it's okay. But I want you to serve me. These are things that Jesus teaches in this episode with the second catch of fish. I want you to know as we end our message today, well, here's a picture of uh, Jesus speaking with Peter as he's come ashore. And another picture of Jesus speaking with him afterward. I haven't done a good job of keeping us up to date with the pictures. But um, as we bring our message toward its conclusion, I need you to understand this. These miracles do not exist just to be interesting stories, and they don't exist just to meet a temper and need at the moment, and they don't exist just to sort of wow you and knock your socks off for no reason. They exist because they're meant to be a living sign, a living teaching of something that Jesus wants us to learn. And we've learned thus far some things about these nine miracles. All of them are miracles of nature, changing the nature of one thing to another, or doing something that overcomes what you normally expect. Next week, next week we will come to miracles of healing. And that's what will happen to you continue this service, this sermon series. We will have next Sunday the Lord's Supper together and the next teaching about miracles. I wonder if you'd stand with me.